We are talking about logistic regression. This is the last video in this series, uh, but you may have started on this video because you're particularly interested in model assumptions. That's great. Welcome if this is the first time that you're with us. If you know nothing about logistic regression, this video will just confuse you. Go back to the beginning of this series. That It's in a playlist and um, we'll catch you up in no time. You'll be an expert. Now, if you're new to uh, my content, you can access all of the, everything that's on this page. There'll be a link at the end of the video in a little card. You can click on it. You can access everything here. Now, what's nice about that is this, as well as all of the notes, and I have loads of notes that you can read, and it goes into detail that I can't go into in, during the video. I also have all of the code associated with the plots and the graphs and the analysis and everything. All of the code is included. And if you hover over these little annotations that you can see why it is and how it is that I wrote a particular line of code. So, and you can cut and paste the code incidentally and stick it straight into RStudio. Also, just to keep in mind that the data set that I'm using is, this is the first 10 lines of the data set. And this data set is available if you install the ML Bench package. And then here's the data set and boom shakalaka. You can replicate everything that I'm doing at home. And that is the best way to learn. Okay. On this YouTube channel, we're creating our programming videos on everything. So let's talk about model assumptions. So a logistic regression model, just to remind ourselves, you've got a binary outcome and we've got predictive variables. And we're trying to evaluate the extent to which these predictive variables individually and in combination with each other can help us uh, predict really uh, the, whether or not the, the outcome variable, which is binary, always binary. In this case, diabetes or not diabetes. And we've got a number of predictive variables that our model has suggested are worth looking at. And these are them. And the, you know, we've got a model and we created it in previous videos. You can have a look at how we did that. We have a model. Do the assumptions of logistic regression, are they applied? Are there any um, hidden problems with what we're doing? And we need to examine that. And in the first instance, we can visually check a few things. And there's a couple of plots. There's the linearity, there's Cook's distance, there's leverage, and there's deviance residuals. Now, we are going to come back to each of these and talk about them in turn. The thing that I want to say at this point is that when you visually check the validity of your assumptions, sometimes you can visually check it and you can be 100% sure that you're good to go, right? So Cook's distance, we're looking for, and you, I'll talk about what Cook's distance is in just a minute. But Cook's distance, we're looking for any observations because all of the observations are listed here, all 800, just about 800 of them. Um, we're looking for, we want to make sure that all of the Cook's distances are less than one. Well, these are all massively less than one. We don't need to do any mathematical jiggery pokery to get certainty of that. We can see it 100% sure that none of the observations have got a Cook's distance more than one. So, you know, moving right along. Not so with some of the other uh, assumptions, right? So leverage, and we, again, we're going to talk about what leverage is. So no, nobody panic. But here we've got some real outliers. I mean, right up there, that leverage is much higher than our threshold line, which is this dotted line down here. Do we need to be anxious about this or not? You know what I mean? Like, Because it, it, it is quite possible that you've got, a, the, you know, outliers that sit out there that you don't need to worry about, but maybe you investigate. Similarly, with the deviance residuals, some of them are falling outside of the lines that we're interested in. You know, and we need to decide the extent to which we should or shouldn't be nervous. And for that, we use some sort of statistical techniques. We're going to come back to all of these in just a minute. So nobody panic. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at the eight. Uh, well, I've got eight. Some people may have more. I don't know. The eight assumptions that I think are probably the most important to make sure that you meet these assumptions. or you've at least considered them very carefully and you don't think there's any problems before we can say that the model that we have you know, is uh, properly valid. Okay, so let's jump right in. We'll just go through these one at a time. And if you've been watching the whole series of videos, um, then a lot of the answers to these questions will be perfectly obvious to you. And I'll just point it out. Number one, that the dependent or outcome variable is binary. Yes, it's binary. It's diabetes or not diabetes in our case. But you've got to check. I mean, we don't, we don't have to check. We know that, you know, but you know, it, you may have a data set that, you know, that has missing values or, you know, they, or there might be something in your outcome variable um, that's a little bit uh, off. There might be an, a category that you didn't think of. Just check that there are only two, uh, there are only two, two categories in your binary outcome variable. Okay, en enough about that. The next assumption is that your observations are independent. Now, what do we mean by independent? I, the best way to understand 
independent observations is for me to give you an example of when they're not independent and then it'll you know that's a good way to understand it. when our observation is not independent here's an example let's say we've got a time series analysis and uh, we've got a group of people and we are checking their blood glucose uh, every year in January so this year we check person a b and c blood next year we check person a b and c we check their blood and we kind of can plot this over time and we've got a time series analysis of their respective blood levels now Person A has his blood tested every January, and so his blood test result, that observation, that data point, is not completely independent of next January's blood glucose level, because it's the same person. And they may, he may, for whatever reason, have high blood glucose levels, and the fact that he had high blood glucose levels at point A in time means that that fact by itself could be an indication that next year it'll be high again. In other words, these two observations are not independent of each other. There may be some sort of dependence between them. So that's, okay, in our data set, we've got, you know, 780 people, and each of them, we just have one observation from each of them. None of those observations are dependent on any of the other observations, right? You may have variables that the values for which are dependent on each other, Right? That's different from observations being dependent on one another within a variable. Does that make sense? So if you take one of your variables, or it could be you know, that across different variables, but the fact that in one observation, in other words, in one row, right, the values in that row are not dependent on the values that are in another row or observation. Okay. Okay. And to really understand whether or not there's independence, you need to think about the study design. So there's not a, a little formula for this. There's a, you need to think carefully about the way the study is designed and the nature of the observations and have a view as to whether or not there is. And some of the time there's obviously is, you know, like the time series analysis, the answer is clearly yes. So, um, so that's, uh, you know, the second uh, assumption. Adequate sample size. Now, a rule of thumb that you can use here is that for each predictive variable, you need at least 10 observations. So we've got, uh, you know, six or seven predictive variables. We've got nearly 800 observations. So we've got more than 10 observations per predictive variable. That's a rule of thumb um, that you can use. You know, if you're way outside of that, you may need to, you know, think about whether or not you've got an adequate sample size. But if you're up there, we've got 700, 800 uh, observations. We're okay in this particular case. Number four, no omitted variables that might bias the study. So is there anything that you didn't collect that might have been important or you did collect but haven't included in, you know, in your data set? So just make sure that there isn't any important information that's left out of your study that may be, uh, you know, that might bias the study. Number five, good logistic regression fit. Now, as we were building the model, we were checking that as we iteratively added additional variables in that you know the model was improving that it was a good fit now there may still be problems and so we need to now that the model is complete we've you know we've got all the variables sitting in there uh we need to kind of relook at this issue and, and i just want to take a few minutes to kind of examine this a little bit more closely so let's dive right in so once your model is complete if you want to check the regression model fit there's this lemon shaw test that you can do that's going to help you understand whether the model's a good fit. And really, the reason why it's worth doing at this point is that it, it tells you about, um, you know, how well the predicted probabilities align with the observed outcomes across a different range of predicted probabilities. Don't worry too much about the technicality of all of that unless you are starting to become like a data scientist, uh, you know, statistician, in which case, you know, this video is, you need to do more than watch this video. For the likes of, you know, the regular Joe Soap, you and me, we want to just do a check and make sure that there's no red flag here. And the way you do that is you run this test, you use, and here's the code here, but um, you run the test and um, if this p-value is more than 0 0.05, then the model is a good fit. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing that is usually when we look at p-values, we're looking for a p-value of less than 0.5. In this case, we're looking for a p-value of more than 0.5, and it is 0.76, 46, so it's really well above that. So we're comfortable that in this case, the model, it's a good fit. Number six is no perfect multicollinearity. Now, we talked about collinear variables in a previous video, and we sort of said, look, if two, um, if two variables are highly correlated, uh, we need to be a little bit nervous. A correlation coefficient of 0.7 or more is you make you nervous. A correlation of 0.8 
you may want to consider removing that variable or there's another there's a range of techniques that you can apply to deal with collinearity when you identify it in that way that's looking at pairwise collinearity right so this variable is you know uh, correlated with that variable and we ask you know is there a problem here with respect to our ability to model the outcome that's not telling us about multicollinearity when there might be multiple variables that when they are considered in combination with each other translate into a problem that might not be obvious when you're just looking at the pairwise combinations right so there's a could be an underlying problem of multicollinearity that's not obvious to you and we need to be able to investigate that so let's just take a quick dive in to check how we look for red flags in that regard. And to look for this multicollinearity problem, we use the variance inflation factor, VIF, and that detects multivariate issues. Uh, here's the code over here. Oh, no, there's the code right there. Uh, you, you can use the, the car package that's going to give you the, um, the VIF uh, function. You apply it to the model and boom, shakalaka, out pops a series of numbers associated with the variables that are in your model. Now, anything that's uh, higher than 10 suggests that there's a problem somewhere and you need to investigate this further. In this case, everything is down, sort of nothing's even at two. So we're very happy that there's no red flags and we can move on. Number seven is that there's a linear relationship between the log odds and the predictors. And I'm just going to talk about, that's another one where we need to kind of dive in a little bit um, and have a, a slightly closer look at this. And, and the reason is, look, here we've got, uh, you know, in each of these facets, we've got um, the values for that particular predictor and we've mapped it against uh, the log odds and some of them look linear glucose does you know age kind of does this is all very subjective um, we might be right we might sort of say look glucose really does look linear you know and maybe no one would argue but uh, some of them you know pressure looks a little bit odd here is that a function just of outliers that are bending the curve I don't know looking at these things isn't good enough sometimes it's good enough like when we looked at cook's distance boom shakalaka happy days you know looking at it was fine i don't think looking at this is good enough we need to be a bit more rigorous and and of course there are ways of doing that so let's dive in so just to be clear for each value in a predictor there is an odds of uh, the outcome being positive or negative or diabetes or not diabetes and we can take the natural logarithm of that and we get a value and we think that there should be a linear relationship between the predictor the, you know, the values in the predictive variable and the log odds. So, you know, that's what we're looking for. Now, um, we said that looking at it might not be good enough. But there is a test you can do, and it's the box Tidwell test. And now, I don't want you to get bogged down in the maths behind this. The most important thing is that you can interpret the results of the box Tidwell test and see if there is a red flag or if there's anything you need to be anxious about. But so that you know what's going on, um, you really are, what you do here is you create an interaction term and it's the interaction between, in this case, we look at pressure and the, uh, the log odds of pressure. And here's where it all matters. Here's the p-value for the interaction term. If that p-value is more than 0 0.05, in other words, not significant, it means that we're in the clear and uh, there is a linear relationship. And once again, I'm just underlining the fact that it's, you want the p-value to be more than 0.05. I know in statistics, we're often looking for less than 0.05. Not here with the box table test, we're looking for a p-value of more than 0.05 for the interaction term. And that is the box table test. Here's the code to do that. Okay, so there's not a function that you use here. You actually have to do it yourself. You actually have to create a variable called you know, pressure log and then put it into your model as an interaction term. So um, I wonder why there's not a package that just does that for you. Somebody will have one. Okay, and the last assumption that we need to look at, and this is the one you know, where you, you kind of need to really focus and maybe have a strong cup of coffee, um, because this is probably where things can get confusing, but won't, because we're gonna like pay attention now, the absence of highly influential outliers. And that means your data set may have certain observations that really influence the entire model in a way that you don't want. Okay, the first thing that we're going to do, uh, these are the visual checks that are up here. Cook's distance, the leverage values, and the deviance residuals. The Cook's distance to me is the most useful and the one that tells you the most straight off the bat. Because what the Cook's distance does is it sort of says, 
for any observation. If we remove that observation from the data set, how dramatically would uh, the overall model be changed, be affected? Okay, and a value of more than one is problematic. In this data set, everything is very small. I mean, you know, we, our values are like 0 0.01 and, you know, most of them are substantially less than 0 0.01. Uh, there's a couple of outliers and the biggest ones are still like in the 0 0.04 range. Nothing's approaching one. So any of the data points in our data set got taken out, the model wouldn't be substantially changed. So that is a really strong sign that this assumption is met. And we'll look at the leverage, we'll look at the deviance, we'll look at the other things because it's you know it's good practice and um and you know you never know you might just bump into something that's worth looking at so let's let's keep going right so this is the part of the document where we we're talking about this highly influential outliers here was cook's distance we said that they all are low so happy days okay leverage let's just understand this carefully leverage values measure the influence of an observer on the predicted outcomes by evaluating how far the observer's predicted values deviate from the mean of the predictors of mean of all of the predictors. Let's have a, it's a little bit easier to understand when we look at it a bit more closely, but if we look at figure eight, we've got a little dotted red line here of the threshold above which we may be concerned. I say may be concerned. And we, there's quite a few values actually flapping around down there. Now, off the bat, I'm not getting anxious about these values that are sitting above the red line. And the reason is we've already got a very low Cook's distance. So we know that if we removed any of these observations from the model, uh, you know, we'd still be in the clear, we'd, it would still be happy days. But had that said, you know, we've got one value that's way up here and we might sort of say, and you know, and then there's a couple of that are quite high. We might say, we might want to look at them a little bit more closely just to check that there's not something odd about them, that there's not some value in the observation that is really uh, worrying or spurious or, or unrealistic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how do we do that? Well, happy days. We've got some code here, and I won't go through this code in this video. I'd encourage you to get this sheet, and you can go through the annotations one line at a time. This video is really trying to get you to understand logistic regression in general. Um, but we basically rank ordered uh, the leverage and we've identified the number associated with that observation. So this is observation 454. It's worth taking note of these numbers, right? 454, 337. These are the numbers with the highest leverage. Um, when I, and I won't do it with you now, just because I don't have the full data set in front of me, but when I looked at this 454, the data, the, the observation looked perfectly normal. There wasn't anything odd about it, except that the person was a little older than most of the other people in the data set. I think the person was 67. When you look at that, you sort of think, well, do we want to remove that observation? No, we are interested in older people and, um, you know, th and it's not it's that strange an age. Uh, so we leave it in. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to leave that uh, observation in. The other reason why we're going to leave it in is because we are also going to check um, this next issue, which is uh, the deviance residuals. And the deviance residuals measure the discrepancy between the observed and the predicted value in the model. And in this case, again, there are a few that sit outside the lines, but not dramatically outside the lines. And we sort of think, okay, well, uh, you know, should we be worried about them? Should we take a closer look at those observations? Of course we can. And once again, I've rank ordered them and uh, from highest to lowest. And here are the observation numbers. So it's observation number 350 is the biggest offender. Observation 229 is the next biggest offender. You'll notice that none of these observations are the same ones that popped up uh, with the leverage, you know, leverage offenders. If one of them was the same one, if, the, if one of them was um, in both lists, I might be a little bit nervous and, you know, maybe take an even closer look, but they're not. Added to that, we've got a Cook's distance that's low for all of them. I'm thinking I'm happy with the data set as it is, and I'm confident that all of the assumptions that we've got listed over here are met for this particular analysis. And so happy days, boom shakalaka. Uh, there you go. That's our analysis. Um, if you haven't already, please click on the link that's on the screen at the moment and you can get access to this entire HTML file with all of the code and the annotations and all of the explanatory notes. And I hope you found that useful. Thanks for watching. Don't ever change. Don't do drugs. Speak to you soon. Bye.